You're listening to the Book Talk Today podcast, a podcast that inspires readers to obtain valuable insights to inform, educate, and improve lives. My name is Orn Abdi. I'm an avid reader, best known for the creation of the One Minute Book Review community, and I'm sitting down with authors to delve deeper into the books they have written to uncover the story behind the story. Hello, Book Talk Today family, and welcome back to another episode of the Book Talk Today podcast. My name is Orn, I am your host, and in today's podcast, we are joined by Dr. Nate Sinzer. Dr. Nate is an expert in psychology of human performance who consults to individuals and organizations seeking a competitive edge. We discuss his new book, The Confident Mind, a battle-tested guide for unshakable performance. And for someone who likes to consider themselves athletic to a degree, who likes working out and performance across both mental exercises and physical exercises, this was a really interesting book because confidence is one of those things that everyone's looking for, but we always battle whether it's self-esteem, whether it's achievement, or whether it's genetic. And in his book, Dr. Nate discusses how we should go about acquiring confidence and some of the battle-tested ways to acquire confidence. And this was also a topic of discussion in our conversation as well. It was one of those conversations that you always look forward to as an interviewer. And hopefully, as the audience, you'll find it very valuable because... In the conversation, we discussed his relationship with Dr. Bob Rotella, who is a world-renowned uh, sports psychologist and works mainly with golfers. And as someone who was big into golf and thought about going professional, Dr. Bob Rotella was one of the guys who I always looked up to. And I read all his books and listened to all his audiobooks uh, while I was out there practicing. And funny enough, uh, when I was actually practicing my golf, and it is one of those things where when you go about understanding the psychology behind becoming uh, an athlete uh, is actually transformative because a lot of people think it's just the skills behind it but a lot of the time it's your mentality and that translates into life as well whether you're pursuing new skills whether you're studying or whether you're looking to improve your uh, personal life and as well as your professional life with your uh, studies or your job etc. So it was a really interesting conversation and uh, it's one I'm really looking forward to share with you now. If you haven't already, please do subscribe to the podcast. Every week we release a podcast with an author to discuss their book and the ideas and principles inside of it. We've got some really interesting podcasts lined up over the next coming weeks. So please do hit that subscribe button, whether you're listening to this on Apple, Spotify or YouTube. The best way that you can help grow this channel is go over to our YouTube channel at Book Talk Today and subscribe over there. Thanks again for listening to this podcast, and I really hope you enjoy this conversation with Dr. Nate. Dr. Zinza, it's a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Oh, on. thank you so much for having me on. I'm looking forward to this. I'm very much looking forward to it as well, because as someone who loves playing sport or is and is interested in psychology, I think the, the crossover between performance in sport and the psychology behind it something that's fascinated me ever since I was young to be honest because we're all, I was always looking to improve my skills in the domains of sports that I was playing but I feel like what was always overlooked was the mental side of it and how the mental side can actually transfer away from sport and into the other things that you do as well so I think your book touched upon many different things that interest me and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Uh, before we get into some of the elements in, in the book and some of the ideas and principles I think it'd be great just to give an introduction into your background and how you became interested in this topic. Well, it's eerily similar to what you just mentioned. Um, I was oh, okay. I was a kid. I wanted to be a good athlete. I wanted to play American football, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I became fascinated right around the age of 12 with the fact that the biggest, strongest, most talented people didn't necessarily dominate in their respective sport arenas. I had the experience of going to a small private boys' school here in the States, which happened to be a soccer powerhouse. And year after year, this particular school produced a very high-performing boys' soccer team. Oddly enough, it was the only team that the school produced, which was consistently, um, you know, very, very good. And I later learned through studying that what the coach of this program had done was to create a shared expectation that should a young boy at, you know, age 11, 12, 13, devote himself reasonably to 
the pursuit of success in this sport, he had a pretty good chance by the time he was 16, 17, to be a starter and an impact player on the team. So there was this collective belief that this program was going to be good year after year. The entire school bought into that program, brought into that belief. You could see posters every Friday afternoon, come watch the soccer team beat, you know, so-and-so academy. And when I was in the ninth grade, I was sitting at lunch one day and I told a few of my classmates that I think in a couple of years, when the guys in my class get some competition under their belts, we're going to have a really good wrestling team. Now, backstory, the wrestling team at the school historically had been a a doormat, okay? A punching bag Mm -hmm. for other teams. We might beat, you know, Mary's school for the blind and infirm, but we would not be, you know, we would, we were not consistent winners. And I was, I was thinking, I was saying, well, we got this guy and he could be good. And this guy could be good. And this guy could be good. And a classmate of mine from across the table looked at me and said, Nate, shut up. You're never going to be any good. Guys at this school don't wrestle well. Now just think about that as a statement of expectation and assumption and belief. He went on to Mm. say, we're good in soccer. Sometimes we're good in swimming. Sometimes we're good in tennis. But we've never been good in wrestling. And we never will be. And I remember sitting back and saying, wow, where's the crystal ball that this dude is using? Look at how convinced he is about something that has yet to happen. Think about the state of his mind and the way he's thinking. Um, And I'm very proud to say that two years later, In my junior year, our wrestling team did indeed have a winning season and had won the next year. And then I became the state independent school champ. Um, And I think it had every bit as much to do with the fact that we did not buy into the self-fulfilling prophecy that we could not be good. We decided to say, the heck with that. We're going to find out how good we are. So it was really a shift of attitude, a shift of belief, a shift of intention that really created our success every bit as much as whatever natural talent and hard work we were ready to put into the process. So that's a long-winded answer to your question. How'd you get into this? I got into it because I wanted to be a successful performer. Yeah, but it seems like in the performance side of it, expectation or the intention or your perception about how you are plays such a large role in your performance. It's not just your skills. It's not just, for instance, your, for instance, your talent. It is your expectation about how you can perform, even if you're coming off a loss. Couldn't, couldn't agree with you more. What you say to yourself about yourself, the stories that you continually tell, the way you narrate your own experience has a tremendous effect on the quality of effort and energy you devote to a given activity. And it doesn't take a genius to figure out that the quality of effort and energy that you give to an activity is going to have a substantial effect on your results, your actual execution and performance. So what we see is that that pre-existing belief, that pre-existing attitude, that pre-existing expectation works its way through and is then pretty much confirmed, reinforced by the results that one achieves. Um, I spend a whole chapter in in my book explaining this, but it is a hugely important part of human behavior, and it goes on all the time in every aspect of human performance we could think of. Where do those expectations originate in your experience working with students, working with studying the psychology of it, is it the inherent genetics of the individual or do you think it's their past experiences or a bit of both? Oh, it, I think it is very much a social phenomenon. They, okay. they hear the stories around them and they internalize them. They, you know, as, as youngsters, we're very sensitive to the inputs from parents and older siblings and any kind of authority figures. And so our expectations or our sets of expectations are very much molded by the social environment we grow up in. So do you think like, did you think back to that, that classmate that you had who said that 
statement about like you, we're never going to be a, a a winning wrestling team or we're never going to be a great wrestling team and did you think about well perhaps his family or his environment were always telling him you can't do this you can't do that you can't do this is that did that ever cross your mind no no i think that particular statement by that particular fella was more a result of the messages that he had been hearing at the particular school oh. for three to four years leading up to that point okay he he was a recipient of the level of expectation that was communicated in the school. Uh, you could say that he was a victim of the sort of social construct about what success is or isn't at this particular school. Um, so he picked it up by the messages that were all around the school um, from sixth, seventh, eighth into ninth grade. So he was, he, he was pretty well uh, brainwashed uh, at the, at the, which produced the statement that he made to me. Yeah, that that brain rushing is a really interesting factor because I think any time you want to improve your performance or you're thinking about improving your performance, it, I think it's it's as much in my experience as it's been about. I've I've played golf a lot and I played golf growing up and I know a famous sports psychologist is Dr. Bob Rotella who I listen to a lot and he, his his stuff. Who I amazing. did my doctorate with at the University of Virginia. Really. I was Dr. Rotella's graduate assistant for oh three God. years. I lived, I lived in his back pocket. Um, so yes, you, you're on the talk, right track. Talk, talk, talk about your experience working with him, because as a golf fan, as someone who's into psychology, I mean, he, he's sort of the gold standard when it comes to that's that that part of it. So, what was your experience like working with him? Um, it was the opportunity of a lifetime. Mm. I literally opened up his mail. I lit I was his graduate assistant. I listened to every one of his lectures for three years. I graded the papers. I organized the other graduate students. I got to spend significant private personal time with Dr. Rotella. I was even in his house sometime overhearing the phone conversations that he was having with some of his professional clients. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I really got a feel for the fact that your confidence, your focus, your state of mind at the moment of performance is a choice that you can make. He constantly reinforced, hey, you have free will to think about anything. You choose to. You can think about hitting a beautiful shot out of a horrible lie, regardless of what's happened up to that point in the round, regardless of what happened last week, regardless of where you are, um, on the leaderboard or off the leaderboard, everything is open to you and you have the ability to make choices and to actually trust whatever talent and training you've been blessed with and you've engaged in. And you can either choose to let that out or you can choose to overlay it and complicate it and compromise it by a lot of fear, worry, doubt, overthinking about your mechanics, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I, I remember it was a, a marked shift in my performance after I read his material, because before that, I was I would set I would step up to a shot and I'd be thinking about okay I've got you know water to my right at about 150 yards you know I've got trees on that side I've got a bunker on the left I've got the winds coming from the right so I can't hit it there, and it was amazing because like you said it's focus the big thing for me was like the pre shot routine, which I think carries across everything that you do now when I, as soon as I learned that it was amazing you know the 30 seconds before every shot is the most important because you know you get your line you get your grip. You stand, stand up to the ball from the sideways, you have one look, then you pull the trigger kind of thing. And that completely changed it. And I think that carries over to so many different things. Absolutely. One of these, one of these ideas that, that I had from a, a confidence perspective, and you mentioned it in the book, is this idea of, you know, starting off your day right and the, the routines and the practices to start off your day right and building up your bank balance. So when you work with your clients, like what is the best routine that, that you tell them in order to start off that day correctly? Because I think everyone wants to start off their day right. Um, when your feet hit the floor, you have a choice to make, okay? I have to put my feet on the floor, I have to stand up, I have to exert muscular tension to overcome the force of gravity, and I do that without typically any kind of worry or concern. So already the minute I am conscious and awake and standing up, I am dealing with forces 
outside of my control. What you got to start the day with is the refusal to devote any kind of unnecessary energy to the things that you can't control and devote your energy to what you can control. I can put effort in here. I can control my attitude there. I am going to make this day an exercise in me doing the best I can about the things that I have control over, and I'm going to do a really good job not wasting any energy over the things that I cannot control. My class schedule, the reading assignment, uh, the workout that the coach has put together, the um, tasking that my boss has laid down upon me. I am not going to fuss about those and waste energy. I don't have control over that. I'm going to decide where I put my energy, where I put my effort. I'm going to make sure that I'm devoting those very important resources to things that I can control. That's the opening message. Is, is that one of those things where it's about preparation in, in, in for that mental block? Because I think so much of making a decision is before you get to that stage. It's like you're preparing for those things to happen to you and then you have a plan for it. Right. You acknowledge, yeah, there's a whole lot of things outside of my control. Uh, interesting exercise to do is to, you know, draw a great big circle on a whiteboard and maybe populate that circle with all kinds of things that you need to do, things that take up energy. And then you put another circle in the middle. All right. Now let's move some of those things from the big circle that you can control into the smaller circle. And you will decide, oh yeah, this is where I need to spend my time. So it's very much a anticipation and a decision once you've outlined what is and what isn't in your control to allocate your energy accordingly. Is that one of the first practices you do when you work with people to ensure that they're focused correctly? Because I think that's like a focus. That's like a focus dimension, isn't it? Well, again, it, it's a decisional process about what you're going to pay attention to. Okay. And the other very important sort of initial exercise, which translates into what you do all day long, is to simply look at the connection between the things you say to yourself, the memories you hang on to, all those conscious thoughts that go in and out of your head, how they connect to your, your mood, your emotional state, and how that emotional state really connects to your physical body, muscle tension, blood flow, um, pupil dilation, hormone production, and how all of that influences how you actually execute. Whether we're talking about hitting a golf ball, hitting a soccer ball, taking a physics exam, or anything else, that connection between thought, emotion, physical state, execution. Getting that across to people is very important because most people don't think about it. And once you understand that the quality of your thinking has ripple down effects, then you can decide to be rather careful about how you think mm -hmm. so that you are optimizing that mind to emotion to physical state to performance cycle. So you think if you if you don't make it past the first stage of that awareness of that thought, it's very difficult to move past to the actual action. Absolutely. If you're not aware of the fact that the things that you say to yourself, the things that you choose to hang on to from your memories, the things that you picture in your mind about possible futures, if you don't have an awareness of those and don't realize that they are not just um, isolated phenomena that are in the abstract, then you will not be able to influence any quality of control over those things. Once you realize that that's not just an abstract idea, that mm. is something that has consequences, mm. then you can start taking control over it. Where is the relationship between sort of looking back into your memories, you know, from sports performance? I think a lot of sports athletes look back to their, their previous tapes or they look back to how they performed in a game. Like how much time should they spend critiquing their previous performance and looking back and reflecting? And how much time should they spend looking perhaps forward and planning ahead? Because I think a lot of people 
perhaps are even burdened by their past experiences and they have trauma or they have anxiety and these types of things. So like, where's the balance between like critiquing? And I know in the book you talk about, you know, one of the limiting beliefs is like not being your worst critic, not being your harshest critic. Um, so where is that relationship? It depends a little bit upon what kind of performance we're looking back upon. But in general, it's very important to look back on a past performance, whether it's a win, a tie, or a loss, and try to glean from that past performance some episodes, some moments where you did indeed execute well. You need to remember those. Yes, it'll be important to maybe look at some of the things that you uh, missed upon, uh, the opportunities you missed, uh, some places where your technique was off, you know, in the case of a student or, or a professor, in some places where your articulation wasn't quite clear. But you don't want to have a high ratio of those to moments of success and progress. Um, unfortunately, after a losing effort, most of us will go back to the film and, well, okay, we lost here. We did this bad. We did this bad. We did this bad. Oh, gosh. You know, and we will just fill our temporary short-term memory with a lot of scenes of, of, of mistakes and setbacks. I think it's important to look at that performance and extract some things that actually make you feel more energetic and uh, optimistic and enthusiastic about your future and maybe pick out a couple two three things that you need to work on mm. but you you pick them out with the idea that oh i made this mistake if i just correct this little hitch in my swing or if i correct this this little communication pattern in our amongst our midfielders ooh we can be pretty good so it's it's not just as much as it is a matter of what you look at, it's a matter of how you look at it and how you intend to use it. Mm. You got to look at your highlights and say, yes, that's going to happen again. That's going to happen in lots of places. That's the way we do business. You have to look at your setbacks and your mistakes as, yeah, they happen, but oh, it, it's not a permanent thing. We can fix it. We can change that. And that's going to make us better for our next game, our next encounter. I think the the last bit is really important. I know in the book you talk about after action reviews and, and reviewing past performances. And a key element of that, if, if I'm not mistaken, is this idea that it's like, what are you going to, going to do about it now? Like, what plans do you have? What process do you have? What principles are you going to put into action rather than just reflecting back and saying, I did this well, I did this not so well, and sort of just leaving it there? Yes. Uh, the, the point of self-reflection is to provide guidance for your future. Um, I've already had two conversations with uh, trainees here at West Point uh, today, looking back at a performance. Okay, what did you do? The good, the bad, and the ugly. What did you learn from it? Oh, I learned that this is this can work. I learned that this can work. I learned that this is difficult. I learned that this is maybe something we need to do more of. And then, okay, now that you know that, how is that going to change what you do in anticipation as you go through the days leading up to your next performance? Well, that means I have to spend more time practicing this. It means I have to really connect with this other person on this issue. And those very practical steps are engaged in with this overall sense of excitement that, yeah, this is going to make us better mm. as opposed to, oh, I really got to get this done because it's going to fix a big problem. Um, I, perspective is so important. I think the excitement of getting better is, is so contagious. And I think that I think for an athlete or for someone who is even a recreational weightlifter or someone who plays sport, I think the anticipation of getting better is, it really is a driving factor for, for someone. And I think it's just easy. It's it's not easy in the sense that it's easy to change perspective. But I think once you get to that stage, then you have that constant fuel to, to keep on going. And good teams and good corporate cultures have that as a core value. We are going to be excited about our future. We're going to be, we're going to have sense that, hey, we're pretty good, but we're nowhere near where we could be. And won't it be wonderful to be continually moving down that road? 
uh, and being excited about what we can accomplish both individually and collectively. Yeah, I, I've, I've seen that a lot with athletes, professional athletes across multiple different sports. You know, after a loss, they're always like, I've, I'm getting better. I'm getting better. Like there's there's so much room for improvement. Like I'm not done. I know recently I watched a, a UFC match, I think with uh, a fight with Israel Adesanya and Robert Whittaker. And Robert Whittaker had lost twice to Israel Adesanya. And he was still saying, you know, I'm getting better. I'm still happy. I'm still healthy. And I'm, I can't wait to get back in there again. And I think that's that's really amazing considering he's just come off a loss that he's been wanting to, to avenge. Well, if you do not walk into that octagon feeling that you are the better competitor, uh, you better not walk into the octagon at all. <laughs> Especially uh, against Israel Adesanya. <laughs> right, against any of those guys. It's like, look, I, I have to feel that I am the best person in this particular contest. Otherwise, I categorically, by definition, think my opponent is. Why would I want to enter a competition against someone who I have already conceded a huge advantage to? It's not particularly practical. Um but I find that many, many people do exactly that because they don't feel that they have earned mm. the right yep. to feel that they can indeed win that moment. They, they, they've convinced themselves for whatever reason that they have to have had more previous success or done a certain amount of prior training or achieved certain standards of you know, speed and strength and practice or this and that before they will allow themselves to say, yeah, I can win this. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you don't have that luxury in this mm. kind of world that we live in today. Mm. Is that a self-limiting belief then? Do you think that's like when you said uh, back when you were talking about that morning routine, it's like before they've hit the, their feet have hit the floor, they're automatically on the back foot? Absolutely. Um, that is That is a way that is a negative self-fulfilling prophecy works out. And unfortunately, it's it's quite common. That's the bad news. Good news is that it's <laughs> not it's 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 not written into our genetics to do that, yeah. folks. Uh we have this great capacity for free will and we can change the way we think and we can nudge our thinking habits to be more constructive. What's the best way to get, to get out of that negative feedback loop then of self-fulfilling prophecies and, and sort of reframe your environment and your perspective for more growth and more excitement and, and more curiosity? Uh, that is a very, very big question, sir. I, can, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if we'll have enough time to right. address that in its entirety. Um, but I think you can, you can start in the, I, I break it down into the past, the present and the future. Okay, mm. you can make a habit of looking back on today and deciding I'm going to I'm going to find an episode, a moment today where I put in some quality effort. I, I'm going to look over my day and I'm going to glean from the day's behavior a couple episodes of just little successes, little things I got right. And I'm going to look also back at the day, maybe back on the previous couple of days. Am I making progress anywhere? What what do I seem to be getting better at? And I challenge anybody to do that process honestly and not be able to come up with a couple, three things every day just by honestly reflecting on their day, looking at their short-term past through this particular lens, through this particular filter, as I call it. So that's a way you build yourself up by looking at your past in those constructive terms. Next, you have to think about yourself in the present. What are the stories that you tell yourself about yourself? Are you able to put into present tense language things that you really understand yourself to be you know, pretty good at? I'm good at this skill. I'm good at that skill. I get better at this. Can you tell yourself stories in the present about how you want to be, even if you might not be there yet? That way you actually engage a positive self-fulfilling prophecy. Okay? Mm. We, are, we are a talented bunch of athletes. We work hard every day in the gym. 
we are the New Jersey Independent School State Champions. Hey. <laughs> you can you you can put you can tell yourself that story and it nudges you to move in that direction. Yeah. So that's how you think about yourself in the present. And you can select a skill, you can ex- select a personal quality, you can select a desired outcome and think about it happening in the present. Tell yourself the story in the present, not I will, but I am, or it is, or I have. So that's a whole class of thoughts about today that people can entertain. And then there's another class of thoughts about your future. You have this remarkable video production studio between your ears. And you can create scenes, you know, still shots, short video clips, epic movies about the desired futures as opposed to the feared catastrophic futures. Mm. Think about how you want a situation to turn out. Now, it's a very good idea to anticipate some of the difficulties that you might encounter en route and to envision yourself overcoming said difficulties. Yep. It's wonderful to envision, you know, standing on the Olympic podium, hearing your national anthem with the gold medal draped around your neck. But you also better be envisioning the competition that you will succeed at in order to earn that medal and the training that you will have to undergo in order to get to that competition, in order to have that gold medal experience. So Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's disciplining your imagination to, to create these constructive energizing, exciting scenes. So we work on our memories of the past. We work on the stories we tell ourselves in the present. We work on the visions that we give ourselves for the future. Mm -hmm. The visualization aspect of it is really interesting for me because that was something that I took from Dr. Rotella um, when with with golf specifically it's like when you step up to a shot imagine the ball fly imagine you know the the height of the of the golf shot the feel that you're going to get and I think he did something where he's like imagine like Tiger Woods does this he's like when he hits a shot he sort of he doesn't do it but he imagines his he imagines his hand going in the direction that the ball is going to go in but he doesn't do it with his hands but he, he feels it so he, he sees the mm-hmm. shot but he doesn't do it and that to me was amazing because it focuses that your mind on the shot that you're wanting to hit rather than the multiple shots that you fear, which exactly. to me was, that was a mind blowing transformation. Yeah. That, especially in the game of golf where you have the time and the um, flexibility to literally decide how you want something to be. You don't have to react the way a, uh, a footballer or a basketball player has to react. You can picture exactly where do you want that ball to end up, whether it's off the tee or whether it's from the fairway. Um, certainly, if you're on the green, there's that cup where you want the ball to go. Yeah. You can envision the target. Then you can envision, as you put it so beautifully, the shape of the shot that will take the ball to that place, Yeah, the height, the uh, the speed, um, et cetera, et cetera. You can envision that shot, the shape of that shot. Then you can envision imagining the feel of the swing that will create that shaped shot that will put the ball to that target. Yep. Boy, you've 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 done such a nice job, literally giving your unconscious, your nervous system the right kind of input at that point. It's easier just to step up to the ball, set your feet, take a breath, while still keeping that target in mind. Yeah, swing the cl- swing the club with a fair degree of unconscious or instinctive grace. Exactly, and and the training aspect of that was really really interesting for me because when I'd step up, you know, onto the range, and I think a lot of people do this in in life in general when they're training or practicing, it's very they just go through the motions you know and i think this is why i think this visualization aspect and perhaps sport in general is so important because it focuses your attention on this idea that when you're doing something is being cognitively aligned and focused in that thing that you're doing not just going through the motions because you don't get that type of feedback from it and my experience has been when doing the pre-shot routine focusing your attention on the step-by-step process 
takes it away from the result of the shot so that you right. can go back. Inst you can sorry. Instead of being preoccupied on what might happen if the shot goes right or if the shot goes wrong, uh, how have I been doing up to this moment? How I, how might I be, what might this mean for me when I have to play the next hole, which I haven't even gotten to yet. Um, it keeps you here now, which is the only place that you actually have any power. Mm. Um, can't change what you did. Can't influence your future because you're not there yet. But here in this moment, you can control what's going on. Use a routine to keep your mind where it needs to be right here, right now, in this moment. I, and I think, I think that translates so well into life in general because so many people live either in the past or they live in the future and it's trying to close that barrier to be present. And I think being present has a very sort of spiritual connotation, but I like the idea of being present from a focused perspective. Being like, okay, you've, you, you have the past experience, sorry to interrupt, but you have the past experience and you that sort of learnt memories and you have the future and you visualize this future and you can sort of bring those two together into sort of disciplined action. Absolutely. I, I have this backlog of constructive experiences because I've been very good at filtering in the right memories. I have this idea of how I would like it to be. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now, yeah, okay. So I've got my vision. I've got my blueprint, my ideal. I've got this collection of experiences with all of that in my back pocket, well, let's see how I can do right now. It makes it makes right now easier mm. if you if you have brought the right things in from the past and you've thought about the right things that you want for the future. It gives you the best opportunity if you just clear everything. All right, let's see how well I can hit the shot. Let's see how well I can play this inning. Let's see how well I can play this wicket. Let's see how well I can play this point in the tennis match. Mm. And that's where we need to have that certainty. I'm certain enough that I can do it. Let's just let ourselves find out how good we are. Mm. Do you think, going back onto the topic of confidence, because the book, The Confident Mind, is very much centered on this idea of confidence. Do you think from your experience, that idea of, of, of harnessing the present, do you feel like that harnessing of the present is so, is the central point of deriving confidence from the things that you do? Like if you're able to harness that ability, that's where your confidence comes from. Well, I, I think your confidence is the sense of certainty that you can be effective in the moment. And it only matters if you can be effective in the moment. I want to have a sense of myself that I can indeed um, throw this ball, hit this ball, make this presentation, answer these problems, so that when I get to that point in the match, that point in the test, that point in the interview, I will feel pretty natural and certain. That's the whole point of doing these exercises, so that you can indeed be somewhat relaxed, excited probably, but not uptight, yeah, yeah. be somewhat relaxed and somewhat natural, unpolluted by fear that you might mess up, unpolluted by doubt in yourself because you have brought into your mind for days, weeks, months, maybe even years, these kinds of constructive memories and you've been telling yourself these constructive stories. And at that point, if you do that sufficiently, you can kind of walk into any encounter and say, okay, well, mm. I'm enough for this. Mm. I'm enough for this. I'm enough. Let's go. Let's see how well I can do it. That's sort of a precursor to the neat magical moments that we all seek. I think that's that's something I've observed with with professional athletes that are really successful because they seem to transition into many different things. And I think their confidence or their their abilities that they've they've had in the sport arena is just able to transfer into into different arenas after that because they have that call it self-belief, call it confidence, call it arrogance, whatever you want to call it. I mean, it seems as if that is 
just a natural part of your character once you go through that experience? Well, I think once you have learned how to reflect constructively on your experience, say in the context of sport, you can then learn to reflect constructively on your experience as you transition to another career, mm. coaching, uh, leadership, um, media commentary, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It, it, I have learned how to become more certain about myself. Mm. And once I've, once I've learned that process, I can apply that process to pretty much anything I choose. If I want to go to law school at the end of my athletic career, I've learned how to equip myself to make progress in learning various skills, whether they be motor skills or whether it be whether they be liturgical skills. Mm. Um, I know how to do this. So I think a very important point is for people to to take away is that confidence can be developed in any particular aspect of your life that you that you choose. Don't think of confidence as this sort of universal quality that applies across the board. No, you can develop confidence in any part of your life that you choose to. And even within, say, a, a footballer's skill set or a hockey player's skill set or a surgeon's skill set, all of those sub-skills within those large sets, you can develop great confidence in each one of them too. So mm -hmm. it's very it's very situation specific, but it's an on it's a wide open opportunity for anyone. Mm. It seems like the building blocks are the same across uh, across disciplines. Like it doesn't really particularly change whether you're doing it, like you said, a surgeon or a basketball player or a golfer. It seems like the the building blocks of improvement, of confidence, of positive feedback loops, of the systems and routines you set up. It seems to be conducive across multiple dimensions. That is certainly the experience that I have had. Uh, mm. I learned all of this and have been applying it, you know, primarily in the world of competitive sports. But at West Point, especially where I've worked for the last 30 years, we have been apl applying these same steps, these same uh, exercises and principles to help people become you know, to pass the various demanding physical fitness requirements, to excel in the classroom, to be good lead, be good student leaders within their cadet experience. And then once they graduate and are out um, leading soldiers in the U.S. Army, the same principles apply in that professional context. Mm. Uh, one of the questions I, I wanted to ask you is this idea that, you know, People might look at really successful business leaders, they might look at professional athletes, and they might think, wow, they never get nervous, they never get anxious, they're making these shots like Steph Curry from, you know, way outside the three point line, or their Tiger Woods hitting like a 62 on the back nine at the Masters, like it's nothing. But in the book, you talk about this idea that embrace the butterflies, embrace the anxiety. You know, everyone experiences anxiety, but the first step to, to get through it is to appreciate it and understand it. So uh, can you just talk about, you know, this fact that everyone goes through anxiety, they feel butterflies. But in order to improve performance, you need to embrace uh, th those feelings. Certainly. Um, one of the great misunderstandings, as you put it on, was the idea that the Tiger Woods of the world and other people performing at that level don't get the nervousness, the butterflies, the jitters, call it what you like, and nothing could be further from the truth. Some of these people may have developed ways of um, making it look like they're not nervous, but if you actually ask them and then you read their biographies and autobiographies after they have retired, um, you will, they'll tell you flat out, I went into this, I, I stepped on the center court at Wimbledon for my semifinal match, and I was really worried that I wasn't going to get a single first serve in. <laughs> well, now, hey, if... If if you're if you've made it to the center court at Wimbledon for a semifinal match in the championships, well, daggone, you've made a heck of a lot of first serves uh, leading up to that moment. Yeah. Yet, I still get nervous. Okay, and that and what we have to understand is that 
that word that we use, nervous, can mean either I'm very apprehensive, I'm very worried, I, I, I kind of expect things to fall apart, mm-hmm. or nervous can also simply mean it's relating to this biological system you have inside you, your nervous system. All those neurons in your skull, all those neurons in your spinal cord, all those fine neuronal pathways that communicate to every muscle and every gland and every organ in your body, which informs those various um, parts of your body to do what they do, to contract, to relax, to secrete, to close off, to open, to close. Your nervous system, the communication network that controls all of that, is going to undergo a surge of activity when you're about to do something that's important. And that could be something that's important because you really want to do it, like uh, win your semifinal match at center court at Wimbledon, or whether it's something that you have to do, like take that final exam in your organic chemistry course. Whenever human beings are in a situation where they are called upon to execute and do something that is important, the nervous system naturally accelerates. There is more activity, more communication going through your body. That is a survival mechanism inherited from our primitive ancestors to wake us up, energize us, open up our eyes, get our blood pumping so that we can be better in those moments. Mm -hmm. So it's very important for everybody to learn to appreciate the fact that Hey, my my heart is pounding. Oh, because my body is getting more blood out to the periphery so that I can be good at this. Mm. Okay? My my stomach is flip-flopping. I'm getting those butterflies simply because my entire nervous system is accelerating a little bit and I got a few hundred million nerve endings in my stomach and they're just <laughs> vibrating a little bit more frequently and a little bit more powerfully than they typically do. And I need to recognize those signals as indicators that my body is getting ready to do something great. So I should look forward to them. 100%. And I got that. I got, I remember one of the most, the first times I experienced that majorly was when I was playing golf and I was four under going up to the 17th tee and I'd never shot under par before. And I got onto the tee and I kid you not, it felt like I was holding onto something that was weighing 100 kilos. Like I couldn't take the club back. It felt like I was there for like, I don't know, 10 minutes trying to think about taking this club back. And it's one of those things where you just have to reframe it. Like you said earlier, like I think this, the whole idea um, of, of this concept, it seems like from our conversation is that that choice, you either go down the route of saying this is going to cripple me or this is an opportunity for me to really show my training and my abilities in this situation. And thankfully I was able to hit the shot, but I, I kid you not, it was it was difficult. <laughs> how, how did you finish that round? I was three under, unfortunately I bogeyed the last. It was a par five and I, I, I slightly hit a bad tee shot, but I was still under par. <laughs> still under par, good for you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, just like talking about this this concept and talking about this idea one of the things that i think is is really interesting when it comes to performance is reaching a plateau because i think a, a lot of people what they do is they improve they get the newbie in weightlifting terms like it might be like newbie gains or like newbie improvements and they see this real spike um, but then after perhaps maybe you know six weeks ten weeks they hit this plateau like what is your recommendation for getting through that plateau is it about embracing the process of improvement and visualizing the future and embracing the fact that plateaus happen or are there some particular steps that someone can go through once they're going or hitting that plateau well i think everything that you mentioned there uh, is absolutely vital you have to keep your eyes on the prize as it were keep keep envisioning the progress that you want to make and you do have to understand that you know improvements in the human animal do not always follow a direct uh, one-for-one yeah. upward path. Yeah. Um, you're going to experience that, like you say, when you're a newbie. You know, you're basically starting from zero. Anything you do is going to produce yeah. uh, some some growth and some success. <laughs> and unfortunately, we can become addicted to that sort of equal um, to that 
trajectory for every episode of effort, I get an episode of improvement, that one-to-one relationship, that linear upward relationship. We, we love to have it. Feels great. Um, but that only lasts for a certain amount of time. The closer you get to your max, whatever your max might be, the rate of improvement is going to slow down because you're getting closer to that theoretical ceiling. The rate of improvement's going to slow down. You're going to experience small improvements punctuated by long periods where it seems like, gosh, no matter what I do, I'm not getting any better. Those plateaus can be very frustrating, but we have to have a certain appreciation for those plateaus. I mean, heck, if you have hit a certain plateau, It means you've worked your way up to it. Now you're challenging the system significantly. Keep challenging the system. Keep putting in the work. Keep being diligent with your sets and your reps, etc. And what's happening is your nervous system and your muscular system are undergoing changes during the plateau, which at some point, some undetermined point, are going to produce a flash mm. of growth, and you're going to get that, ah, yeah, I made that new gain. Yeah. I made that new gain. I broke through the plateau, and that's a wonderful experience. Um, unfortunately, our world today is so immediate gratification oriented that we're not very patient with our plateaus. Uh, too much social media, too much you know, instantaneous communication, um, it's so funny to listen to a long-term old-school athletic coach describing the fact that you know not a single player on her team has had the experience of writing a letter, putting it in the mail, putting it in the mailbox, and waiting two weeks for a reply, which was the way the old coach did her business. For decades and decades, everything is quick, 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 quick. We expect everything to be quick, 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 quick. Human body doesn't respond that way. We need to have an appreciation for those plateaus, for the fact that while we're on the plateau, very important changes are taking place, which we don't quite see till it reaches that critical mass, and then we get it. Oh, and then we're going to be on another plateau after that. So Mm. get used to it. (laughs) <laughs> yeah the never-ending plateau and the the levy breaks like my personal experience with that was my handicap so one year it went down from 19 to 12 and it got kind of got stuck at 12 at around sort of i want to say the, the late part of summer because i was playing a lot in summer and i just hit this plateau and uh, october to january slash february was like hit the range every day 500 balls a day kind of thing just constantly going through repetition after repetition after repetition and it wasn't until may of that year where i went down from 12 to 5 in a two week in a two week period i basically hit like four rounds under par in a row and just like you said it's just something happened like one swing one thought and it just it just cascaded which was amazing and you you never know when that's going to happen yeah and it's beautiful it, it is so beautiful when it happens, but you have to give yourself the opportunity to have that wonderful aha moment when your s- internal software finally goes through the upgrade and bang, you, your, your swing smoothens out, um, your hips move through the ball, whatever it is, something happens and it's this great moment. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, go for those moments, yeah. you know? The, the the beauty, the feeling, the, the confidence that you get from that, I, I think is you can't replicate that. Like you can't get that from social media likes. Like you said, you can't get that from praise. That internal sense of confidence from going through those, I don't think can be replicated at all. Absolutely. The things that you earn through your diligent participation, your disciplined practice, um, those are those stay with you forever. Definitely. They definitely do. Anyway, Dr. Z, it's been a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much for coming on to discuss your most recent book, uh, The Confident Mind. I I really appreciate your time to come on and speak about it. Um, Where's the best place that individuals can find you, whether it be a website or or social media? 
Um, there is a website, um, drnatesensor.com, where people have been sending me a lot of messages over the last month since the book that's, came out. That's I'm, really good. I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to receive more. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to spend this hour with you. And my best wishes to all your listeners for a wonderful 2022. <laughs> Yes, yes, definitely. I agree. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Hopefully you took away some inspiring messages from Dr. Nate and some ideas about how you can go about acquiring your own confidence and how you can perhaps dispel some of the myths in your own thinking about how the best ways to acquire confidence and improve your performance as well. I'd like to note that I think performance is important in the physical realm but I think a lot of people don't talk about the importance of your mentality in in terms of performance and a lot of us obviously aren't full-time athletes so we're not looking uh, to to be out there and perform and, and do these types of things as athletes do but we still need to perform on a day-to-day -day basis whether it's for our family uh, for ourselves or for the people around us our teams etc so improving performance is important uh, and acquiring confidence in order to improve performance is really important as well so something that I'm I'm really in, uh, passionate about and something that I really hope that you took some key messages from this conversation if you haven't already, please do subscribe to the podcast. Every week, we release a podcast with an author to discuss their book and the ideas and principles inside of it. We've got some really interesting conversations lined up in the coming weeks, so definitely do subscribe to our podcast. Whether you're listening to this on Apple, Spotify, or YouTube, head over to our YouTube channel. That is the best way that you can support the channel and get the name there. Thank you again for listening to this podcast, and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode.